Okay, this is it. First impressions, all right? I've been living under a rock for the past 10 minutes. Okay, this is it. Hecarim, five health. And he levels up when you've attacked with seven ephemeral units instead of eight. Uh, that's interesting. So basically I've said for a while that Hecarim doesn't need a nerf per se. I'd rather a tweak that makes him more of an ephemeral synergy concept. Uh, and he effectively just got that nerf. Hecarim got minus one health, and that's a pretty big deal. I mean, the difference between health is, uh, kind of huge. Riders as well. Uh, something changed with the riders. Okay, they're two twos. Okay, whew! Good thing you pointed that out, because otherwise I was I was gonna go on talking about this for ages, and then I would have scrolled down a little bit. All right, Hecarim's fucked. Rejoice, brethren! This card is no more. I will say, Hecarim is a card that you know is definitely like, you know, he he was he was in need of some kind of touch up. That being said, and obviously at a top level, he wasn't super prevalent towards the end, right? Yeah, basically Hecarim wasn't like super dominant at a top level, but still felt like, you know, fairly kind of like difficult to to play around seeing like Shadow Isle stuff. And this is a really, really huge nerf. Like the fact that Riders are now 2-2s, two the fact that he has 5 health, this is a big nerf and it definitely puts him in line. Like Hecarim, Hecarim has fallen, we are victorious. I'm going to be reading these, um, these... Uh, notes as well. Tweak Tekram to be less of a powerful finisher in any deck and more of a specialized ephemeral deck bomb. Seeing a lot of play, but in situations he wasn't ever leveling up, which indicated he had too much genetic power. Looking to shift his power deeper into ephemeral synergy while leaving him viable, but weaker option for Shadow Isles decks in general. Reduced his health by one at both levels to make him easier to break down. His attacks also did too much damage. Yeah. So basically, the way the way champions by design are meant to work, and there's a few exceptions to this, but in theory, they they're, they're aimed to be effectively not super good, or like just a little bit below competitive, like competitive viability when they're not leveled, and a little bit beyond that when they are leveled. So Hecarim seeing play even like when he was never leveling up, and he was leveling up sometimes, but that was kind of icing on the cake at that point. Hecarim, Hecarim seeing play like that just, you know, it, it wasn't really as good. Onslaught of Shadows uh, came down to 2 mana, so now instead of a 3 mana summon 3-2-3-2, three, two, three, two, it's now a 2 mana summon 2-2-2-2, two, 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 which is kind of interesting. Uh, it does definitely make certain decks that will rely on Ephemeral Summoning a little bit better. Like, for example, my Prankster Burn was messing around with Onslaught Shadows at the end, uh, and I, I do think it was fine in that deck, and now it's a 2 mana card instead of a 3 mana card, which is fairly sweet. You are, of course, losing some, you know, valuable attack points as well, so it's not for free. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and say, like, I don't think Onslaught of Shadows is necessarily gonna see a lot of play. Although, it does feel like more of an actual card now, because honestly, it didn't feel great before. Although, can't block Fearsome now. We'll have to see how big of a change this ends up making. It'll probably be a small one, but for the most part... Hecarim's nerf is fairly big, right? And we'll have to read through the rest of the Shadow Isles nerfs before we can make any significant meta predictions, but Hecarim doesn't look like he's going to be like a really, really major meta threat moving forward. Okay. Callista. Three health. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, that's a good start. So, bond with an ally. Level up. I've seen three allies die. And now it loses that text in exchange for one health. Now, the Callista on the level two, you know... Now this, this has 4 health, because of course it's plus 1, plus 1 still. And now it is the first time I attack each round, revive and attacking ephemeral copy of the strongest dead allied follower. This round we're bonded, and it takes damage for me. Ah, oh. <clears throat> That's interesting. Skip Tacrim level up. Oh, did I? Oh, they have plus 3 instead of plus 2. Yeah, basically his, his level up is a bit more impactful. Okay, you're right, I did skip it. I don't, I don't think that's going to matter that much. But, you know, I mean, it's a big deal for Ephemeral decks. They, they did increase the synergy on the card. Guys. Callista, okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Callista is fairly interesting. I'm going to go through a second run of this. And we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about, you know, what's going to happen. Callista is potentially huge here. So, you no longer get this free bond at the start, which is nice, because the one health is going to be worth more, period. Straight up. Straight up. 
And now this is bond with an ally, grant it. So, in, oh, sorry, instead of bonding at level two, now it is. When she attacks, she revives an attacking ephemeral copy of the strongest dead allied follower. It takes damage for me. So, it'll revive during the combat step, and it'll, it'll revive to the right side of her. And whatever she gets blocked by is going to not deal damage to her. It's going to deal damage to the strongest dead unit, which will get revived into combat. So, it's like here. Let me, I, I, I think I'm understanding how this works, but it's also, you know, who knows, there's, there's room for misinterpretation. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw a picture. So it's like, okay, you've got the Callista down here. This is the lady with a s spear. It's a spear. I know that. I've played enough, I've played enough League of Legends, by which I mean not at all. So here's Callista and she is in attack mode. Okay. And then she summons uh, a fucking... Let's say Dark Water Scourge. Okay, so this is a Dark Water Scourge. It's like an octopus, basically. Um, she summons a Dark Water Scourge, okay? And here she's fighting like some angry guy and uh, some other per big head person, okay? So it's like this this is an ephemeral one. She'll she'll resummon that when it goes, and then Basically, this will take the damage for her. So let's say if if this thing, if this thing she's fighting has five or more attack, then this, the Dark Water Scourge, let's say it's a Dark Water Scourge, will die during combat, and this won't take any damage, right? I assume so that, that should always be how it works, because it always will summon on the right side of Callista, right? But if this has four or lower attack, then the Dark Water Scourge will effectively get to attack twice, right? That should be right. Because even though it's ephemeral, it's not striking. It's taking damage, but it's not striking. So, it's like, this will damage Callista, which will damage this. And then if it's got four or less and Dark Water Scourge has five, then this will still fight this. That... It takes damage twice, not attack twice. Well, I know, guys, I know it, sorry, I, I, was, I was trying to like... Explain it in a weird way. I know it's not an actual attack, but it's effect. It's an absorbing an attack, right? No life steal. Yes, it's no. It's no life steal, right? But I, 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 I think that's that's pretty straightforward. Correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> that's pretty. That's pretty good, honestly. So when you when you compare this to her old ability, when you compare it to her old ability. She is losing the ability to revive a plus two health ally basically once. Wow, Callista's nuts, dude. Holy shit. Prankster Burn is looking good right now, guys. Callista is a card I was running. I was experimenting in that deck, and it was just sort of being of making the cut. New Callista definitely makes the cut in that deck. Onslaught of Shadows is unironically good there all of a sudden, too. Like, these, these two buffs are already good for Pranks to Burn. If you, like, so people are going to ask, like, what the best Callista deck is, and I think it has to be Pranks to Burn, 100%. It has to be Pranks to Burn. There's no way it's not. There's no way that the best Callista deck isn't Pranks to Burn. Or something very similar to it. It, it, it would, it might be a few cards off, but that's the, that's the deck that can trigger the most deaths, where she, her aggro concept can probably be most utilized. I guess the, the big question, though, is, like, is the revive going to be worth enough value for her? And also, that deck is one that is currently running six champions, and it would have to cut Teemo. So, it, it would look pretty similar, but it might go through some forms because of, uh, because of her inclusion in the deck. Black Spear. Cost from two to three. Well, wow, really? That seems like a bit much. I don't know. Out of all the Shadow Isles cards, I actually think Black Spear was very fair. It's like, it was very, very easy to play around. It's a very, like, chunky card. <clears throat> a lot of decks were running, like, two Black Spears. I like the idea of SI nerfs, and honestly, I don't think it mattered, like, that much what got nerfed in SI, but it feels like Black Spear was, like, fairly low on the list, all things considered, in terms of, like, SI nerfs. Because there's, there's, like, I mean, there's big ones, right? It's like Hecarim, Frenzied Skeeterer, Glimpse, Mark, 
Rekindler, uh, even Elise, you know, there's there's a lot of things that I probably would nerf before Black Spear. Black Spear, it honestly felt quite fair at 2 mana. It's strong, but, you know, very limited in its range. The opponent can do a lot of things to play around it. It felt, it felt kind of neat in that way. It's like there's a lot of spots where maybe you shouldn't take a block on Elise's Spiderling, because, you know, you don't really need to, and you don't want to enable their Black Spear there, that kind of thing. <clears throat> But, I mean, they're basically like, they, they want removal to be really weak in this game. I don't have a real problem with this. We're breaking that power and efficiency up with changes to Blackspear and Mark of the Islands. So, they're, they're nerfing Mark of the Islands, too. And they made Border Lookout an Elite, and they renamed him Vanguard Lookout. You know what? I kind of support that change. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think this is, like pretty solid design. I think this is like a very easy change. This is a, I think a pretty big deal, by the way, for, for decks that are looking to swarm elites. I don't think like elite synergy decks are going to be big, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I think they're close. I think like one more synergy card and they're fine. So that th there's a few things to understand about this. So the two synergy cards for elites are Battlesmith and Vanguard Squire, basically. And the thing about Battlesmith and Vanguard Squire is that they both affect a very narrow range of cards. In reality, a lot of people like putting the Elite tag, put put every Elite card together and make an Elite deck with Battlesmith and Vanguard Squire. How it ends up working though is like Battlesmith and Vanguard Squire are only good with cheap Elite cards. Um, so like Vanguard Squire doesn't really have synergy with Garen, for example, because you want something more cheap so that you can play Vanguard Squire earlier. A 5 cost elite doesn't help her at all. Like, basically, literally at all. And Battlesmith is somewhat the same way, where it's like, if he's stuck to the board for that many turns, you've already won the game anyway. And he's only good on certain stat distributions. This is one of them. The fact that <clears throat> when you have plus one, plus one buffs in card games, they really want to be attached to stuff that has, like, low attack, high health. Uh, like, for example, it's better to buff, like, Laurent Protégé than it is to Fiora for that reason. And Vanguard Lookout is a pretty premium buff target for Battlesmith. Like, becoming a 2-5 is a pretty big deal. Um, I will say, I don't expect this card or that deck to be, like, competitive staples or anything like that. But I think they're fairly close. Reinforcement 2. Uh, I don't think Reinforcement's that good. But, I mean, it, it would be on the list, yeah. So, yeah. Border Lookout, I think this is just kind of a, a cute change. It'll make this deck feel a little less awful and... I don't know. There's this there's this meme in card games where I don't I don't know why. I have no idea why, but people don't like it when there's one card that's just the worst version of another card. And people did point out that Border Lookout was a worse version of Boom Kuruki. And now that it's got that tag, it'll basically shut people up. So I, I like it. It's a cute little change. It's not really it's it's basically only positive. Mage Seekers, here we go. So these these cards have been pretty awful for a while. Let's see where we're at. Mage Seekers are among some of the most interesting characters in Demacia that aren't soldiers, keeping them all cards have a home principle in mind. We weren't satisfied with how Mage Seekers ended up. So we made it. Instead of discard a spell to guarantee me power equal to cost, grant me plus two, two plus two once you've casted a six plus cost spell this game. Whoa. Holy shit. That's not bad. What the fuck? A four a four six five. As soon as you've cost a 6 plus cost spell. I will say, something that's really funny. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure if you play Remembrance at 5 mana, it doesn't count for this. Am I wrong? Am I mistaken? Because, I, I mean, Remembrance will cost whatever it, it costs currently, right? It doesn't count as a 6 mana spell when you play it as something else. I believe. But yeah, this this is a pretty big deal. You're correct, yeah. So, it might be a little bit tricky to get this out. But, I mean, that's that's kind of ridiculous. Like, float, float into Remembrance on 3 into just Mage Seeker Insider on 4 for a 4-6-5? Four that's, like, that's kind of just good. Like, that's kind of really good. What the heck? What happened here? Okay, huh. Yeah, I mean, so these, uh, 
These Mage Seeker cards, that's that's a pretty big buff. I mean, you're gonna be using it with like Lux, basically. Let's actually look at the six plus cost spells and think about where we're at there. So the thing to understand that's most important is that it is stats, and stats are gonna do most in the early game, right? Stats are a concept. Out of all resources, stats do tend to fall off, and you do want them nice and early, right? So, and it costs four, and it demands a six plus spell, which means, basically, you want to, um, you want to make sure that you have played a spell nice and early. Presumably, it's got to be like double flow into the six, into the Mage Seeker, right? It says once you cast, you probably have to play the spell after you play Mage Seeker. I don't think that's true. I would be surprised if that's true. I'm basically one eight. I don't think it has to be on board by its phrasing, but it's hard to say. I could be wrong. So the thing is, like, I'm looking through the six plus mana cards, and you can definitely run Mage Seeker in some other decks. But at the end of the day, it's just gonna be in like a Lux or Remembrance deck. I think it kind of has to be. It's like I'm the nature of the nature of the new Mage Seeker, and I'll look at the other Mage Seekers because apparently they got changed too. But basically, <clears throat> it's just like. In a Demacia deck, where you're playing, you know, a 6-plus mana spell, which is going to be fairly rare. I mean, you can trigger it with, like, 4 Demacia, but then you're not playing it, like, early and aggressively. You really, really want to curve it out with, like, Remembrance. That's kind of the ideal, right? It's like, Remembrance on 3, Mage Seeker on 4. That's going to be the big, like, 2-turn combo. Now, the one, the one thing that does get detracted from that is that Lux decks have had a pretty optional slot in that I personally like where they'll sometimes run Mage Seeker Conservator. And part of the idea of Mage Seeker Conservator is that on turn three, you have your Conservator die so that you can play Remembrance at five mana, because of course, you know, if you've played Conservator, that's that means you have one less mana, so you only have five. But then you get to play Remembrance for that five mana, and if you summon the 33% Radiant Guardian, then it'll pick up the buff, right? You can't really do that anymore with the new Mage Seeker, uh, what's it called? The Blaster? Mage Seeker Ass Blaster. Insider, yeah. Mage Seeker Insider. You can't really do that with the new Mage Seeker Insider combo. The Conservator will have to be cut. Because if you discount your Remembrance at all, it won't count for Conservator visibility. So, at the end of the day, there's not, I would say a lot of people are going to fall into a trap with Conservator where they'll look at this card and they'll be like, oh, I'll, like, look at all these, look at all these six mana spells that I can combine it with, right? And they'll look at, like, different regions and stuff, too. They'll, they'll be like, they'll be like, oh, I can combine it with Dawn and Dusk, or I can combine it with four Demacia or Harsh Winds. And in reality, like, I think that's all not really going to work. Like, it's just that it's most power when you can play it on turn four or five. Any later than that is not really going to be that useful, like, actually at all. And also, most of these cards are going to just be less reliable. It's like, you're, you're going to want to run these other cards with other kinds of decks. Like, for Demacia wants to be run on a unit-heavy deck, which you can't really fit um, the Mage Seeker into, I think. Harsh Winds is obviously like an Ezreal deck. Reckoning is, yeah, I mean, that you can't fit that into that deck at all, I think, right? So... And, like, even Unlicensed Innovation, it looks kind of appealing, but then, of course, Remembrance is just kind of a better version of that. Now, what you could do, what you could do is, you could run a kind of, like, Lux, Heimer, Demacia, PNZ deck, and if you want to say Mage Seeker Insider is so good that three Remembrance is not enough, and you want to commit, commit to the double float game plan, then, honestly, running one or two Unlicensed Innovation wouldn't be bad. Unironically, you could run one or two unlicensed innovation in that version of that deck, only if you were already in PNZ. But for the most part, the Mage Seeker Insider is kind of boring, at least in terms of what spells you want to combine it with. Everyone's going to be excited about, like, oh, I'm going to combine it with this spell. Oh, I'm going to combine it with this spell. It's like, just combine it with Remembrance. That is that is the purpose of this. Like, these stats are going to be at their best when you can just play them on turn 4. Stats are an early game resource you don't want, like, plus 2, plus 2 in the late game. It's not really going to do that much. And Demacia, you know, really wants to be playing at that, like, aggressive tempo as well. Okay? So, that's Mage Seeker Insider. Mage Seeker Investigator. <laughs> wait. Wait, th didn't its old ability used to do this? Didn't they just rework this? It used to create a detain after a 6-plus cost spell, right? And then they changed it 
to this, and now they're changing it back, which I don't mind, by the way, but it's funny that there's no comment. Where's the comment? <laughs> was discard a card to create a detain? Yeah, it was pretty similar. So basically, as soon as you've cast a six plus cost spell this game, she's a three, 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 draw a detain. The question is, if you're playing a Lux Karma deck, you know, like a kind of controlled Demacia deck with that six plus cost spell theme, would you rather run this or just a detain? I think the sad thing is you'd probably rather run a detain. And there's a few reasons why, um, but part of it is that detain wants to be getting surprise value. So let me, let me go back and let me break this down a bit. She creates a detain for free though. Right. And that's, that's a weird thing, right? So let me, let me go ahead and take, take you through another example, which is the idea of what the heck, what are they called? Oh, I'm still on this filter, that's why. So let's look at the clump of wumps and the chump of wumps and the mushroom. So the thing is, it's like, we all know Mushroom Cloud is a bad card that you don't run. And the reason is because you'd rather run chump wump and even clump of wumps. Like, clump of wumps is a card that is kind of like short of being competitive, but it's actually pretty close in certain decks. And of course you run it in like Teemo decks. And you could look at this and you could look at this and mushroom and her and detained and think that they're similar in that you would always rather run the thing that gets you the thing, right? It's like clump is better than mushroom cloud. You'd never run mushroom cloud, right? So by the same logic, you could be like, well, mage seeker just gives me detain. So why would I run detain? Cause it's a three, three, three draw card, which is pretty premium. It's pretty premium. So first of all, it does have that requirement. That's a pretty minor one. The real reason is because a, the mana cost is such that you're probably not going to be able to play them on the same turn. It's like, there's a lot of spots where you want to detain, but you have between 5 and 7 mana, and you don't have either 8 plus mana or the 2 actions that are going to allow that, right? For Demacia is a better example. Okay, that's also a good example. Fuck, you guys are- wow, you're good. That's- whew, that's- that, that is a really good example, actually. I- <laughs> Man, you guys should be the streamers. Four Demasi is a pretty good example. That's another 333 that creates a thing in hand, right? But the difference is, is that the Tain is something that, A, I mean, for Demacia, you want to swarm the board when you have it. And B, the Tain is something that you want to use reactively in, like, select situations, right? It has some surprise value, which means giving up the surprise value feels pretty bad. You know, this this has the body on board, which is valuable for this kind of deck. Whereas the kind of like six, the the Lux Lux Karma deck, I really I will I do need to show you the deck. Like I, I showed it before, but the deck I'm talking about will look roughly like this. Roughly, there's many different versions of like kind of like control Lux, um, but it would look roughly like this. Okay, and. The idea of, you know, the idea of running the 3-3-3 the three, three, three here, I think, is just going to lose a little too much value, right? The problem is, is that you'd rather get some surprise value to your Titan. Honestly, it's close. It is it is close. But there's going to be, like, I'm, I'm envisioning so many situations where you've got less than 8 mana and you want to Detain, and your Mage Seeker in hand you just wish was a Detain instead, right? Or it's like, you play the Mage Seeker, and then your opponent's like, well, I guess this guy's got Detain, I will... You know, they'll, they'll play differently when they know you have Detain. It's definitely, like, something that does need to get some surprise value. So, I actually think that this Mage Seeker Investigator is, if anything, maybe a nerf. Old Mage Seeker was not good, but it had it had some applications. Eh, no, I, I shouldn't say this is a nerf. It's, like, it's, it's about the same. I feel like it's going to be a little tricky to run this card. It might be better than running Detain. It will be pretty close. Like a 3-3-3 draw card is good, but I think like losing the surprise value and forcing the extra action is gonna not make it worth it. Whew, whoa, 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 spoilers, hang on. Mage Seeker Persuader. Grant me plus one, plus one and challenger once you've cast a six. He costs two mana? What the fuck? He's a two mana, four, three challenger. Holy shit. Oh my God. Jesus Christ, this card is just fucking solid. You could just run this, dude. Like, a 2-3-2 two, two stat line is pretty premium. Jesus Christ.
Unlike the Insider, it's like... He's not terrible even even when you're not drawing it. This one this one actually might be able to be run with more spells. Hang on, let me let me go back to the client. Dude, this this is this is these are these are pretty crazy changes, man. Crazy changes. Just made masters on EU. Your videos and streams helped me a lot, thanks. Yeah, no problem, buddy. <clears throat> Imba 11 out of 10. I'm kind of with you on that one, show 10. Like some some of these some of these changes are pretty crazy. So all you have to have done is cast a six plus cost spell. Yeah, and it's pretty much gonna be the same pool. Yeah, I don't think anything's changed here. I think you might be able to run it with like a four Demacia thing though. The big difference between these is like this card doesn't need to be played like super early. Brood Awakening. Yeah, that can't be that can't work. Yeah, no, it, it is the same deal. It's like you do kind of have to run it in the same kind of deck. There's there's nothing really additional. The biggest difference here is this one's less committal, right? Committal is a really, really, really important concept to be thinking among the terms of, like, in terms of how you should evaluate things. Commitment is a really, 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 really huge factor. The thing is, when this ability doesn't work, it's still a 2-3-2. Two, that's huge. That's fine. You can just play this. That's okay, right? Like, that's what... Ken Kenpunk Pickpocket is almost auto-include in PNZ competitively right now. And in most games, it's just a 2-3-2, two, two, right? That's just a decent stat line for what you want right now. And this one is much more commitment, right? Because it's a 4-4-3. Four, four, so if this one's ability doesn't work, you're fucked, right? This one, if its ability doesn't work... You know, you're on a weird draw, you draw it early, you just play it on turn two. That's totally fine. And that's a really, really huge deal. Oh my god. These cards are crazy, dude. This is just a huge buff to, like, the, the Demacian playstyle. I, I actually think, I unironically think that, dude, I, I might actually just run Unlicensed Innovation with this deck. Like, all of a sudden, making sure this trigger will reliably happen is really, really important. Like... When you look here, here, wait, 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 let me, let me pull it up. Oh, shit. It's like, when, when you look at this, you need a 6 plus cost spell now. Badly. And, like, you've got Remembrance and Judgment and back-to-back, -back, but Ionia provides none of that. Which means, like, I think I, I might want to shift these decks into, into Heimerdinger. Simply for the ability to run Unlicensed Innovation. And I'm not joking. Because being able to trigger these reliably... Like, the, the most important thing is to get these abilities out fast. You need to get these abilities out early, right? And the earliest you can get them is turn 4. Unlicensed innovation is kind of crazy. Flash buff? Shh, guys, don't spoiler me! But yeah, like... Unironically, when you look at the 6 plus cost spells, the most important thing is being able to get something that you can play early, right? You need to get something you can play on, like, turn, turn 3 or turn 4 reliably. And there's almost no proactive spells in the game, like truly proactive spells that you can just vomit out onto a nothing board. It's basically Unlicensed Innovation is the second spell in the game that works like that. So unironically, this card just got a fuck ton better. This was a just straight up non-competitive card. It's just a worse remembrance. Like, this, this is actually just like you versus the guy she tells you not to worry about. Like, this card just fucking sucks. This is just remembrance fucking chopped liver version, right? But suddenly, I just want to run more than three remembrances. Suddenly, this card is just... I'm looking at this, and I'm just starting to aggressively salivate. This is kind of crazy. Like, how did, that, how did we get here? How did that just happen? Okay. Apparently, you guys are saying Flash got buffed, too. Which, you know, adds, adds to this uh, hypothesis of switching into the Heimerdinger version. But we'll get there when we get there. Chill, 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 chill. Crowd favorite. Dude, I'm loving these changes, by the way. I'm glad that... I'm glad that these patch notes are a bit longer than last time. This is actually really fucking... This is this is filling me up with all kinds of emotions. Crowd favorite lost one health. I think that's honestly pretty fitting. I think that's honestly pretty deserved. I think this card was low-key completely crazy. I think he was a bit held back by aggro as an archetype in the past. I think that this nerf is going to be a nice, subtle change to him. That's going to make him feel a little bit more flavorful. It's going to make him feel a little bit more aligned. And it's not actually going to nerf him that much. Honestly, yeah, I mean, I think this is fine. It's a pretty easy change. I like it.
It's it's just very minor, but it kind of it fits the theme of Noxus, which is like you know, typically they have like slightly weaker bodies than than healths. Although it kind of like hurts my my ability to it kind of like. <clears throat> what's what's the word? Immerse myself in this game's lore? Because this guy has just a super fucking beefy body, man. And it's so strange that he would be like a fucking one health little twink. Because like, I don't know, I just see such a disconnect, but maybe that's just me. Iceborne- Whoa, what the fuck happened here? Two plus two! It's... Crazy, what? Yo! What? Dude. Okay, I can I can get behind this. Slow? Yeah, no, I know it's slow speed now. But damn, man. Damn. It's 2 plus 2, guys. <laughs> so, Iceborne is obviously being messed around in, like, Iceborne spiders right now. I think some people are saying it's a nerf. I think it's... It might be fairly close. I don't know. I don't know, guys. A lot of you guys are gonna say it's a nerf... I think I think that that might be a little edgy, but I'll 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 take your guys' word for that. Scribe of Sorrow buff. It is it is a buff to the Scribe of Sorrow deck. It's true. Slow speed. What the fuck? It is. It's pretty crazy. Imagine trying to buff a spider only for it to get kills, and Iceborne into five men do nothing. Oh yeah, that's true. It's like fizzleable now. Wow, this card blows! What the fuck? This is a crazy nerf! Sorry, what, what am I talking about? I, 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 for, sorry, I forgot this would like, targeted in the same way Pack Metality did and therefore was just completely fizzleable. What would, what are they, th what are they thinking? What, what the hell? Iceborne Legacy hasn't seen much play, let's nuke it from orbit? What? Why? Like, you just, you move in to buff a 1-1 spider and they fucking static shock it and you pour emote into concede. Now, poor emo into concede is not a bad line, but they're gonna force you into doing it so much. What the heck? Ew! Oh my God! Jesus Christ, that's terrible. Yeah. Okay. This is this is really really bad. They they actually literally just deleted this card from existence. This is weird, man. I will say. I, I like most of these changes. This one this one is a little disconnected. Cause Iceborne Spiders has actually seen like a decent amount of play in Masters for the past week. And now it won't anymore. And both of those are the opposite of what this is saying. Cause this is saying they haven't seen much play and let's boost the play rate, and that's not true and it's gonna do the opposite. <clears throat> now I, I will say about this change is that like I mean, when, when, when you're a Ride developer and you're working on these, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these things take time. I'm pretty positive that, the, like, changes like this were forced out, like, sometime before this card was seeing, like, a decent amount more play, right? Like, th this, was, this was probably a patch that was decided, like, you know, a week and a half ago before Iceborne and Spiders was getting much attention. And, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know. <clears throat> I like most of these changes. This one, I think, this one, I think, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Slow, slow can't be a combat trick. Yeah, slow speed, the fact that slow speed forces you to target. The thing is, it's not, it's not really slow versus fast. That's not the issue, guys. The thing is, this had to be burst speed. It had to be not deniable for it to make sense. Because even, some of you guys are saying at least make it fast, but that wouldn't really help. Not really. If you make this fast speed... Your targeting is still gonna get denied. Your spider, like, you, you try to, like, the thing about Iceborne Legacy is, as a card, you want to use it on spiders, pretty much. I mean, there's a few other targets, but mostly spiders. Spiders are 1-1s, one which means your opponent will kill it with anything. Like, Static Shock. Static Shock will literally stop your entire game plan from going off. Static Shock, right? Even if it's fast speed. It needs to not be deniable. And of course, you know, I mean, then I will work on it now, not even like, 
not, not nearly at the top of your list, but Will of Ionia. I'll, I'll cast this on a spider, and my opponent will be like, okay, should I use Deny or Will of Ionia? And they'll rope me, because instead of having zero options, they'll have like two or three. They'll be like, hmm, Deny? Or maybe I'll counter this with Will of Ionia. Which card should I play that will make my opponent snap concede? It's it's over. It's As soon as they stop this from working, Vile Fee stops it, exactly. This card is dead in the water. This card is actually just completely unplayable now. Like, it's, it, I can't explain how much this card just got nerfed. This is a crazy, crazy, crazy nerf. Like, it, it, it will never get off anymore. It, will, it, it actually won't get off anymore. That's, that's rough, dude. That, that's rough. That's rough. Okay, pack mentality. Okay. Plus two, plus two, and overwhelm. So it's one less, but it's for the entire game. I think this is also a nerf. Because you kind of, like, you'd rather have... Since it's really, really late game... So pack mentality, for, for a while, it's kind of had the same problems as Iceborne Legacy, which is forcing you to target one of your own units, right? And it's feasible in all the same ways. Except, in this case, you know, you don't necessarily have to... Um, <clears throat> You don't necessarily have to target something that's going to die to Vile Feast, which is nice, unlike Iceborne. And, of course, Pack Mentality doesn't require you to have allies of group anymore. Now, I, I will say something really interesting. For those of you guys who follow Runeterra religiously, like I do, you might actually remember this exact version of Pack Mentality existing in the past, which was plus two, plus two, and overwhelm outside of group. This was never in a live client, but in a video they released before Runeterra launched. In a video they released before Runeterra launched, they actually leaked this exact change, right? Read the text. The old version of Pack Mentality was both a tad confusing and effective. Improve while also making it more of an option for non-tribe decks. Yeah, what are you guys talking about? Oh, you're saying it's not fizzleable? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I know it's not fizzleable, guys. I'm talking I'm talking about the old text as, you know, an explanation for Iceborne Legacy. So the new text, give allies plus two, plus two, and overwhelm. Iceborne Spider says pack mentality instead of Iceborne. Yeah, basically. So this has basically shifted its concept from a tribal finisher to just kind of like a... I mean, when are you going to use this? It's kind of like a worse for Demacia, right? It's not fizzleable anymore, which is nice. <clears throat> it's not permanent either. Oh yeah, you're right. I didn't I didn't see that. If that's what you guys were telling me to see. That's weird. Why I guess this this text is like just Yeah, I mean I don't I don't think this is really going to be a playable card. It's kind of like a for Demacia that gives overwhelm, which is cute. It's a nice finisher and I mean, the fact that it gives Overwhelm is pretty big. Maybe, maybe you can, like, top-end with this. <clears throat> it's kind of like Decisive Maneuver, except instead of being... It, it costs two more mana and is at slow speed just for Overwhelm. That just seems bad. I don't I don't think this is actually going to end up being a decent card. Poro Snacks gets a uh, minus one cost. So I've gone on the record before. Saying that even if Poros and Axe cost 2 mana, it would still be a bad card. So Poros and Axe is now basically what Iceborne Legacies was doing. It is a 3 mana burst thing that gives everything of X plus 1 plus 1. In this case, X is Poro, instead of, of course, X being, in the Iceborne Legacy case, any named unit. I mean, plus 1 plus 1 to everything of a category is nice. Uh, the Poro category is somewhat weak, but... It is actually usable. I, I was kind of exaggerating when I said Poros and Exit 2 would still be bad. Poros is going to be a pretty tight package. You will be able to mess around with it. The question is, like, would you use Poros Snacks with it? Because, like, you can play the Poro package. I was I was actually going to play it in Ezreal today. Like, I was I was going to try running a Heart of the Fluff in Ezreal. Just because I'm kind of bored, and honestly, it doesn't even look that bad. I mean, okay, it looks pretty bad. <clears throat> I mean, it's fine. The thing is, like, if you're running the Poro package, is it worth it to run Poro Snacks? 
Because you can't dedicate that much of your deck to being Poros, right? There's only like two or three good Poro cards in the game. So the idea of running Poro Snacks with it as like a three mana, give Poro allies ever plus one, plus one. I mean, it's burst speed, so it is a combat trick, which is kind of nice. <clears throat> Compare it to Hearthguard. Hearthguard has a 5-5 five, five body and does extra units for two more mana. Right. And that's a good comparison, exactly. It's like, Poro Snacks is just kind of a bad card. The thing is, a Poro package is not even that weak. Let's look at Poros. Unironically, a Poro package is not weak. It was in the original version of my Ezreal deck before I replaced it with Elnux. Like, and it was actually doing pretty well. And now that Elnux are getting nerfed, Maybe I'll go back to the Poro package. I was running three Lonely Poros and one Poro Herder. And I wasn't running Poro Snacks. And I still won't, right? It's like, Poro Herder's a good card, and Lonely Poro is a good card. The problem is, none of the other Poros are good cards, right? And it's it's more of a package than a build around. And I think that's that's a really, really important thing to understand, right? When there's not really a lot of build around potential when instead it's just like a small pocket combo you know he here's the thing <clears throat> it's important to be able to tell the difference between like a package and a build around right and the difference lies in scalability okay so let's look at elnux elnux are a package an early mistake people made and why elnux were considered a meme for a while is because people were building them as a build around they were using cards like Parade Electro Rig and uh, Counterfeit Copies. And I have my Elnuk Fuck Meme deck, which is also using it as a build around with Counterfeit Copies and the Overwhelm buff, right? Elnuks are not designed to be build arounds. They scale very, very poorly with the idea of cards like Counterfeit Copies and Parade Electro Rig, which are impossible to make reliable. In reality, Elnuks are a package. You want to run 3 Bull Elnuk and 3 Troop of Elnuk and nothing else, right? And that's just because at the 6 card package, you're basically achieving maximum value, whereas any more than the six card package, you know, three counterfeit copies go to nine, three parade electro rig goes to 12, you're getting a lot less value out of that 12 than just like the doubled up six, right? Diminishing returns, in other words. <clears throat> now, an example of a build around instead of a package might, and this is a might, you might argue Cursed Keeper on the contrary, because Cursed Keeper is you could say a bigger package, right? Because depending on your perspective, Cursed Keeper actually requires a lot more synergy because to make it reliable, you need a lot of ways to sacrifice units. And then in addition to that, you need other ways to give you additional units that can be offered as sacrificed to be able to enable it going off, right? So take for example, the Prankster deck, right? It's like Keeper is good in this deck for a few reasons. Mostly, and this is like somewhat counterintuitive, but it's because we have Cask Salesman. The thing about Keeper is he requires death triggers, right? These are going to be Ravenous Butcher and maybe Oblivious Islander. The thing about Butcher and Islander, they both do this in very different ways, but they incentivize you, they, they, they force you to run by themselves another kind of card, which is a card that can enable them for value. You can sacrifice something without losing the downside. And they do that differently. Like, Butcher will incentivize you to run cards like, I don't know, use Cask Salesman, which this deck runs. That's that's why we're using the the Keeper package here, just because Butcher has that, like, additional, like, latch target, right? In use Cask Salesman and Hapless Aristocrat. And in a deck that's running, like, Darkwater Scourge, you can use Islander to maybe, like, link Keeper with that. But this is this is a card that will force you down a rabbit hole of deck building, much more so than something like Troop of Elnux. So you could call this a bit more of a build around, right? Here's the thing about Poros. They're not build arounds. That's the problem with Poro snacks. Poros are decent, but they exhibit really big diminishing returns. Lonely Poro is actually a good card, unironically. Poro Herder is actually a good card, unironically. That's it. There's no other good Poros, and there's no other good Poro Synergy card. Poro Snacks went from a really, really, really bad Poro Synergy card to a fairly mediocre Poro Synergy card. There's, there still remains no good Poro Synergy card, which will keep Poro in the package category instead of the build around category, which will keep Poro Snacks at low value, right? Kind of feed back into itself. So, Lonely Poro and Poro Herder is still fine as a package, but I wouldn't recommend building a deck around it. So, Poro Snacks change is not going to affect very much.
Troop of Elnux. For the top six cards in your deck, summon each Elnux and shuffle the rest of your deck. And I assume they uh, did basically the... Uh, they, they, they made this happen, like, literally. They, they just turned it into a literal shuffle, I assume. Well, we want some level of randomness to create varied gameplay. <clears throat> Preserve Troop as a linchpin and counterfeit copies deck. Busted out the hypergeometric calculator and done some playtesting to find a better rate for the troop that allows more dedicated Elnuk decks to be powerful while reducing its effectiveness in decks just looking to splash the Elnuk package for value. Okay. <clears throat> yep. This is basically everything I expected them to do. This is everything I wanted them to do. This is it. Elnucks are dead. Rejoice, brethren. <clears throat> this is it. <clears throat> there's just... There's no playing this card anymore. Six! Wow! Oh, what a crazy nerf. That's nuts, dude. That's actually just crazy. There's just... There's just no playing this card anymore. And the sad thing is, it still won't even be, like, the worst thing in the universe, but it won't be on the competitive level. It can't be at six. There's no way. Elnix are a meme again. Yeah, Elnix are a meme again. And the Void Conspirator gets hit by one power. I think that's deserved... Uh, to be perfectly honest, I mean, elusive decks were still pretty strong. I don't know, I think a lot of people stopped playing, like, Wayfinder decks because they got a bit bored of them, but Wayfinder decks were still showing, like, a quite high win rate and a really stable meta deck. And I'm pretty happy with them seeing, like, some minor change. So, I think that's gonna be- What the heck?! Why?! No, not- not Chumplump! Oh, fucking pee-pee hands, dude! Why?! Oh, man. Dude, this card was nuts, though, huh? Dude, Donger's out. <laughs> oh, well. Our boy. Why not make it a 3-4? Yeah, this is so much worse as a 4-3 than a 3-4. Brittle Steel, Keck W. Dude, this card actually kind of blows now. <clears throat> I mean, do you still have to run it in Ezreal? Can you even run it anymore? This card actually just... I, I You probably still have to run it. It doesn't feel as good, though. That's- that, like, you will feel this one health, dude. That's- you will feel that like crazy, man. Like, I think you still have to run it, but damn, that's gonna hurt. Overreacting? Uh, I mean, it still might be on the playable level in Ezreal, but... It will definitely make the deck feel a bit weaker. There's a lot of situations where this card will just die a turn earlier. I, I, I don't think I'm overreacting, personally. This The difference between 3 and 4 health is a really, really, really big deal. 3-4 or 4-3 chump? Well, 3-4 would be much stronger. Like, that 1 health is nuts. That's that's a huge part of the reason you play this card. I'm not saying I'm going to cut this from Ezreal decks, necessarily, but this is a nerf I'll really feel. Like, when you're playing, the, like, Ezreal decks, or, you know, Teemo decks, God forbid. <clears throat> I don't know, man. Why even play Ezreal anymore? It's like, no troop. Chungus Wungus has three health now. Might as well just put Poros in that deck. At least Poro Herder's a 3-4, right? I think I will just make it a Poro deck, honestly. So, let's review. Just, like, short review. So, Shadow Isles loses some value. Callista gains some power. The Mage Seekers are nuts. Crazy, crazy package, and everything else is coming down in value. It is the it Luxheimer time to shine, dude. And Flash of Brilliance got a buff, apparently. Never mind. Create a random spell that costs 6 plus in hand. Is this a buff? Wait a second. Wait. Jump Lump can't block Zed anymore? Right! Can't block Zed anymore, that's pretty big. Can't block Lucian either. This, this, like, this minus 1 health is just a big deal. That will, like... You will feel that in almost every game you play Chump Lump. You will be like, man, I wish this had four health. It's a high roll nerf. It's kind of interesting. So there's two ways there's two ways to look at this. It's a buff with Mage Seeker? Is it? I don't think that's true at all. With Mage Seekers, you just want to play Remembrance. They only need to activate once. You don't want more six plus cost spells in hand. There's two ways to look at this, right? In determining whether Flash is a buff or a nerf, okay, <clears throat> a common spot is going to be trying to activate Lux and Heimer on the turn they get played, right? 
So if you're playing the Luxheimer deck, which I'll just show you just for a little bit of context. If you're playing Heimer Lux, or maybe you're just playing Heimerdinger, you often want your Flash of Brilliance to be pulling a 3 mana spell. Or the reason for that is pretty straightforward, because of course the 3 mana spell is going to allow you to, if you're playing Lux, you'll level the Lux on the turn you play her, which sometimes you actually don't have a 3 mana spell in hand, so you have to flash into a 3 mana spell so you can level the Lux on the turn you play her. That does happen sometimes. Or, with Heimerdinger, nah, I mean, you just want the ability to make more floor be gones, right? That's kind of Heimerdinger's only job to create more of this card. So, Flash of Brilliance having some odds of creating a 3 mana spell is, I think, a pretty big deal. And that is, unironically, part of the reason why I like Demacia with this. It's not necessarily a huge part of the reason, but when we look at Demacia spells, they have a lot of valued 3 mana spells. They have, you know, like, On Guard, Prismatic Barrier, Relentless Pursuit, Standalone, Succession... And that's pretty good, right? Like, when you compare this to other colors, it's like they don't have a lot of, like, valued random 3 mana spells. So Flash's ability, and Flash, keep in mind, can only create spells of the colors you're in, right? It's not random from any color, it's just the two colors you're in. So Flash is now creating a 6 plus mana spell every time. <clears throat> Let's look at what that's going to get you here. So it will get you back-to-back, -back, for Demacia, Hextech, Redoubled Value, Remembrance, Innovation, True Shot, Reinforcement, Progress, Dare, Judgment. That's a pretty sick pool, I'm not gonna lie. So that's a pool of total 10 cards, and 20% of those are gonna be stuff that will enable your Mage Seekers early. <clears throat> it will be impossible for you to re-trigger your, like, your Lux or Heimer off of that off the turn you play it. It's a pretty big buff. It might be. Honestly, I mean, flashing into, like, one of these feels bad. I will say, like, when you flash into, like, you know, counterfeit copies or chain vest or radiant strike or rummage or scrap dash assembly or purify or some perks map, none of those really feels good to flash into, right? You can't flash into Pursuit of Perfection anymore. That's also nice. It's a pretty big buff. Well, here's the thing. It will matter a bit what colors you're in. <clears throat> I would say it's likely a buff overall. It's a nerf to Heimerdinger. Flash don't give you another 3 cost spell to trigger Lux, plus giving you another floor be gone. It will force you into more 3 amount of spells. I, I, I will say it can be either a nerf or a buff depending on what other colors you're in. I don't think it's as simple as either a nerf or a buff, right? I think it's... I would say it's probably a buff to this style of deck. It forces you to run more 3 mana spells, basically. It's more of a nerf to Heimer Karma. Yes. I think that's true. I think it is a nerf to Heimer Karma. Because you're getting less good cards on the Ionian side, and on top of that, you are more starved for 3 mana cards in that color combination. Whereas Demacia gives you a couple good ones. I agree with that. I think it's a buff for this deck, though. Honestly? These, like... Lux decks are looking pretty fucking good, guys. I'm not gonna lie. This is looking kind of scary. Like, zero irony. There has to be, there has to be something in tier 1 here. There's no way there isn't. There's no way there's not some kind of, like, controlly Demacia tier 1 deck. It doesn't even have to be control, per se. It's like Heimerdinger is not really... Like, Heimer Lux is kind of more of a mid-range deck than a control deck. You could, you could definitely call it a control deck. But, I, I, I wouldn't... Hmm. Interesting, interesting. But yeah, overall, the Flash of Brilliance, it's a fairly minor change. It's going to be a slight buff for some color combinations while being a slight nerf for others. Rummage. To play, discard two, draw two. If you have exactly one other card in hand, discard one to draw one. <clears throat> That's very surprising. I'm shocked. Well, it's a big buff. <clears throat> I think this is actually a pretty huge buff. Discard aggro was looking pretty hot. <clears throat> I've been liking where discard aggro has been positioned. And it's a buff to that deck. Very, very specifically. I hate rummage, dude. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to be a buff to most decks. It's like Ezreal will still not run rummage for the same reasons. I mean, they might run like one, maybe two copies, possibly. Overall, not a big change. I think discard aggro is kind of... Jinx aggro is kind of the one deck that was using rummage in a solid capacity. Let's go ahead and pull up the discard aggro we were playing around with yesterday. This is Manu S's discard aggro. And I think... Oops. I don't have it on screen. Whoops. I think this is...
probably the best way of playing this concept right now. If you want to mess around with discard aggro after the patch, this is going to be a good starting point for you. I think crowd favorite and cutting out the burn tools is pretty good here. It's a very different way of playing discard. It's going to look weird at first, like no mystic shot, no get excited, but I actually quite like this. I think this is just actually the best way to run discard, as counterintuitive as it might immediately seem. But this is going to be the kind of deck that I'm thinking about when I'm saying, you know, rummage is the rummage buff is going to make this feel a bit better. Of course, you know, I guess crowd favor got nerfed one health. It won't matter too much, but yeah, I mean, I guess you'll definitely feel that a little bit. Okay, so back to patch notes. Unstable Voltition. So this card has been a joke for a while. Old text, new text. So wait, what? I don't get it. Grant me plus four and quick attack once you've cast the six plus cost spell this game. So it's just it's just the the order of operations. You can play him and then cast the six plus cost spell after. So this card is still terrible, basically. Like when you compare him to the mage seekers, God, that feels so bad. That's a real, like, you versus the guy she tells you not to worry about story. Don't compare this card to the Mage Seekers. That's gonna feel really, really bad. Don't, don't do it, guys. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, we gotta move on fast. Brood Awakening. Huge! Five mana! Gigantic! Completely unplayable! Iceborne is trash! Moving on. Okay. So, unironically, I guess the big question is, could you use this in, like, a Nox Spiders kind of concept? Would that work there, now that it's 5 mana like it used to be? I mean, it's like an arachnoid host that... <sighs> I mean, you definitely could. It's not terrible. You use this spell mana too. It's deniable. Is like th This is definitely a buff for spiders, because you could consider running this card at 5 mana again. It's better than host usually. I think this would be better than host usually, yeah. I don't know. This is actually a weird one. I'm not sure how to evaluate this change. Spiders is a very, very strange deck. Whereas, like, Brood Awakening will feel completely bricked in some spots and much better than host than others. Your board is flooded with units already when you can use it. It can be. I don't have super high expectations for Brood Awakening, but it might see slot ins into that deck. Mark of the Islands is down to plus two, plus two. God damn it. I'm gonna have to delete this deck because of it. I made, I made this deck as a joke. <laughs> Alright guys. Deck is gone. Rest in pieces, dude. <clears throat> Good night, sweet prince. Yep. So, Mark of the Islands. The question, the question on your mind. <clears throat> Do you still run this? I mean, you still have to in like aggro stuff, right? I don't know. Do you? Is it better than transfusion? It's like a worse transfusion now, right? I mean, I wouldn't say it's it won't see competitive play. Because it, it, it isn't as if this card will literally completely cease seeing play. But this is just bad. Like, this is a huge nerf. Maybe if it was zero mana. Worst Brothers Bond. Like, it's worst Transfusion. You could run it... You definitely might run some amount in, um, you know, like a kind of like fearsome style deck still. <clears throat> no longer instant three copies. I think this can be run as a one of. I agree with that. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can, like, you can definitely splash this into things. It's not terrible, but I will say, I mean, this card does not scream just gigantic, huge, nutty card anymore. Like, I will say this card is still a competitive consideration. I, I shouldn't call it trash, that's an overstatement, but it's important to understand how big of a nerf this was. This was a big nerf. Okay, Rekindler, 7 mana. Wait, this card was 6 mana before? 6 mana? Revive and Champion? That seems pretty good. 
I guess it's seven now. Well, thank God for that, huh? So, interesting, interesting. We got a lot of changes this time around, guys. We got a lot of changes. Dude, I can't wait to build some decks. F for Rekindler Garen. Yeah, Rekindler Garen is, is getting a big F. Huge F. The watch list. Okay, Elite Frenzy Skitterer. Mentioned keeping an eye on fearsome units as a whole, so consider this an addendum directed at specific cards. At least in Frenzy Skitter are both durable, versatile, and evasive threats. Um, okay. I think this is fine, by the way. Glimpse Beyond, Shadow Assassin. I'm pretty okay with this. I, I actually wouldn't have liked it if they nerfed Elise. I think if they if they had nerfed these things too, that would have been an over nerf to Shadow Isles for sure. Like Shadow Isles got tapped. Rejoice, you know. Shadow Isles is honestly like I don't want to do that edgy thing where I say Shadow Isles is like overrated. At a top level, it probably wasn't the strongest region in the game. I don't know. It was all right. It was pretty good, but at like anything other than a top level, it was like very. It's very very prevalent and most importantly, very very versatile. It's kind of its versatility is kind of what makes it a lot more cancerous than its power level should indicate. And that's kind of the most important thing, right? <clears throat> it was just a little too versatile. I'm pretty fine with Elise remaining in the game. And to be honest, I know some people think Frenzied Skitterer is like the best card in the entire game. It's pretty fucking good. It's really good. But I don't think it was the best card in the game. And I think like having one bomb is still fine. Like the fact that other cards got dealt with, I think like, I don't think we're going to be in a state where Frenzied Skitterer is going to be like as prevalent. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, Shadow Isles will still be run, and Skitterer will still be run in Shadow Isles decks. Those are both going to be facts, but it's a card you can at least, uh, you know, you can play around it a bit more than you can play around some of these other cards, which is nice. I don't know. I, I think, like, between, like, the two or three big Shadow Isles nerfs, I think this is totally fine to keep this in. I'm not saying I would have necessarily, you know, I, I mean, you could have docked it, like, one attack or something like that, made it a 2-3, I don't know, but... I think this is totally fun. I don't. I don't think it's a real issue per se, like some people might might say. Uh, Glimpse Beyond, efficient card advantage tool, soft deny, certain that, da da da. When you say da da pa pa, pivotal core pa pa, yeah yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably fine. I don't know. To be honest, this is this is gonna be like somewhat of a hot take, and I'm looking at this quite differently. But I think Mark of the Islands was probably the card that needed the nerf the most, um, or arguably Rekindler. And both of those got nerfed. It's like, Glimpse is a very, 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 very powerful card. It's really good. But, as long as some other things in Shadow Isles are being dealt with, I am down to, you know, play, you know, on the on the same Glimpse and see if there's uh, any issues. It's definitely, like, it's good to the point of being auto-include, but I don't hate it staying in the game the way it is. And Shadow Assassin. Shadow Assassin is the most played guard in Runeterra, and for good reason. I'm basically one-eighth gay. Is it? What's the reason? It's in the starter decks. People like Ionia. Reasonable elusive stats plus free card advantage make this card a near auto include for Ionia and frequently splashed card for other regions. Discussed and tested out a number of base changes. None of them left the assassin in the spot that felt right. Okay. Game pacing and feel. Casting a burst speed spell now puts some time back on your timer. I actually quite like that. As a roper, I've I've gotten kind of slapped by this in the past so that feels good to me expedition archetypes the, oh so they're just mixing up some of the buckets yeah i don't really pull out a, a lot of expeditions so i'm not really going to talk too much about this and you know where that's good in the future i might do some forms of expedition guides i'm not sure uh you know and then maybe maybe i'll talk more about that so <clears throat> early stages meta impressions early stages meta impressions so, Shadow Isles is obviously getting bumped down a bit. Let's look at where, where we're at on a meta list right now. Um, so, we're going to go ahead and jump into the site as it is right now. And I'm going to be making some changes for sure. But basically, this is a rough sketch of where we're at, right? Where we have, you know, Rekindler Garen is doing very well. Kinko Elusives is doing very well. They're getting nerfed by the Conspirator. Ephemeral Midrange is doing pretty well and didn't actually receive that many changes. Like, Hakram feels quite a bit worse for sure. Fearsome Rally and Ezreal. Ezreal hovering, you know, kind of like it could be low tier 1 right now. It's been, it's been kind of right around the brink, so I'm going to have to, like, mix things up a bit. 
The biggest thing is that Lux Karma or Luxheimer, and I'm not sure which of those decks is going to be better. My money's on Luxheimer, personally. I think Luxheimer just has better odds. That's going to be a big bomb. Black Spear and Shampo cannot target allies. Oh, shit! This, this one actually matters. Units should no longer activate when they're dealt zero base damage. So, wait, what's base damage? Does that mean when it fights, like, a Caustic Cask? Because it says base damage, not zero damage. Does that mean that Crimson Creator now no longer works with Barrier? Thermo? It's basically just Thermo Beam, right? Zero cost Thermo. I'm pretty sure Barrier still works, because it says base damage, not zero damage. It says zero base damage. Which, I think, implies that Barrier will still be a damage reduction to zero, which implies that that should still draw you a card. But I don't know if any of us can really be sure. This is just open to interpretation. We don't know if base and if, if, if barrier and tough will still work. I would guess that they do still work. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so meta, meta, meta evaluation. Something in, in Lux area is gonna be pretty fucking good. Some, something in that area is going to be kind of nuts, actually. I will say. My guess is Luxheimerdinger. And after this, I'll probably build that list. Like Luxheimerdinger, new Luxheimerdinger, and how it's going to be built. I will say, Luxheimer is definitely, definitely, definitely a hardcore mid-range deck. Like, it's so hard to call it a control deck. Now that it's got Mage Seekers as well, it's like, the strategy is pretty straightforward. Double Float play Remembrance or maybe Unlicensed Innovation on turn 3, play a Mage Seeker on turn 4, and then on turn 5, you'll want to be maybe thinking about playing like Heimer into Flash or Lux into Flash on turn 6, right? It's just like, it's kind of a curved deck. Now, it does have some nuances because it's running a lot of spells and you can do some interesting stuff, but it's definitely not a control deck, especially not anymore. The thing about Mage Seekers is they don't skew you deeper into the control game plan. And that's, that's really, really important to note. It's like, with um with something like Ezreal, it's like, it gives you a kind of like control finisher per control card used, roughly. There's big asterisks attached to that, but I'm not going to get into that now. Whereas Mage Seeker, this is just like, kind of beef. It's just stats, right? It's just like, play Remembrance on turn 3 and they'd get rewarded by this like, big ass unit on turn 4, right? Basically, that's it, right? Mage Seekers are... Very, 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 very mid-range. And I'm kind of, I'm anticipating maybe like two unlicensed innovations in the deck. Maybe like one or two would be a good uh, middle ground. Because you really, really want to make sure you're getting that like turn three double float game plan off. That's going to be really, really important. So yeah, that's going to be a solid game plan. Um, I'm excited to build that deck. I think that Lux Karma or Lux Heimer... Like I say, my money's on Luxheimer, but Lux Karma or Luxheimer are going to be really solid decks. Like, something in that area has to be tier 1, for sure. There's, I think there's actually just no way it's not. Like, the Mage Seekers are a pretty big buff. They're getting buffed in some other ways, too. The thing is... The thing to understand is that right now, and this is going to be true in most patches in general, but to stay the same is to get better, right? Um, basically, the top is coming down, right? So, let's look at that uh, the way it is. So, Hecarim is coming down. Mark is coming down. Black Spear is coming down. Shadow Isles, in general, is coming down. Crowd Favorite, even, is coming down a little bit, right? That's a small thing. Troop of Elnux is coming down, and with it, Ezreal is coming down, right? Trump Wump is coming down, and with it, Ezreal is coming down. Ezreal, I don't think, will be able to be Tier 1. Navori Conspirator is coming down. So, basically, you'll notice that everything in Tier 1 pretty much is coming down. Rekindler also, which makes Rekindler Garen harder to play. Everything in Tier 1 is coming down. Which means the best things in the new meta are going to be stuff that will, uh, basically, Tier 1 decks that will survive these nerfs by only getting minorly nerfed. And the examples of that are going to be Kinko Elusives, because the Norvori Conspirator nerf is fairly minor compared to a lot of the other nerfs. And Demacia Allegiance. Now, I don't think Demacia Allegiance will splash Rekindler anymore. But Demacia Allegiance is still going to be a powerful deck 
with other splashes. And it is possible, it is possible that you can I'm just run it with Mage Seekers. Gay. There might be some weird Demacia Allegiance Mage Seekers deck. I, I definitely have to theorycraft that one out. It is possible that that's going to be a thing, right? So, again, the, the decks that are going to be best are Tier 1 decks that only get minorly nerfed. Or Tier 2 decks that uh, either get better or stay the same, right? I'm basically one eighth gay. So the biggest thing is, like, Shadow Isles in general is getting worse across the board. And Jinx is on the up and up. So let's look at, like, Spider Agra, for example. So they lose Mark of the Isles for being in Shadow Isles. And, of course, they're losing, you know, a bit of value on crowd favorite. But for the most part, Agra Shadow Isles game plan is fairly untouched, right? So I think there's a good chance that the Jinx... PNZ Nox discard aggro is going to end up being the best aggro deck. Although it's quite a bit trickier to play than spiders. Now it's possible that the uh, brood awakening buff is bigger than I give it credit for. That one's hard to read. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And of course you do have Callista because Callista is pretty sweet. Although I think she can only be run in certain types of decks, right? Which brings me to uh, basically, what, Prankster's? I don't know, I mean, Prankster gets buffed in some ways. Like, Kalista's really good here, but we're still lacking, like, power one-drops, and Kalista's gonna force us out of Teemo, which is gonna starve us for one-drops even more, which is kind of an issue. So, it's gonna be a little bit hard to level Kalista without... The cask salesman value as well. So you could go into some like Nox Shadow Isles with Callista. That could be fun. Overall, I think the Spiders deck is getting buffed in some ways and nerfed in others. I think you do unironically run Callista in that deck now. I don't know. You definitely could slot in Callista. Overall, Nox Spiders is just like down a little bit. So let's let's go ahead and start uh, cataloging this and you know the best the best way we can a paint diagram. Okay. So, I'm going to visually represent each archetype here in ways that are uh, inherently understandable. So, you guys will understand what this is. Okay. And this is going to get a... Uh, you know what? I'll, 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 give this, I'll give this a neutral. It's either getting like a little bit worse or staying the same. But it's, it's pretty much staying the same. I will say the Mark of the Islands nerf hurts it for sure. But it's like, it's pretty close to neutral. This is an insect. This is an insect. Insects have antenna, my friends. Do you see any antenna here? That's what I thought. So, spiders is roughly staying the same. Demacia Allegiance. Well, it depends if we're talking like relatively or totally. I guess is kind of like the larger considerations. I, I I should I should actually say let's let's do let's not make it relative, okay? So this is gonna be like a, a non-relative version. So that's a little red arrow indicating that they're slightly worse, okay? I'm gonna make Demacia now. They're kind of like yellow soldier people. Now, the second color in a Demacia allegiance. This is allegiance. I'm representing allegiance here. As you can see, these are bannermen. That's why they have this banner. Okay, so these are pretty nuts. These are going to stay the same. Now, what staying the same means, we're going to draw a black horizontal line. Staying the same is premium, right? You have to understand this. We're, we are doing an absolute scaling here. This is not relative. In absolute scaling, to stay the same is to get stronger, okay? Because things overall are getting weaker on the top level, right? So they are staying the same, roughly. They lose Rekindler. They're going to have to find, like, different forms of being run. But overall, I don't think they're getting very hit. Like, at the end of the day, you can play, you can play the Demacia Allegiance with a lot of different things. And the Demacia Allegiance is, like, the cards in and of themselves are basically not losing anything at all. It's like nothing is being lost there. Now, I think Ezreal 
let us let us express Ezreal here. I'm gonna draw Ezreal here. As you can clearly see, he's got this is a gauntlet. Um, and Ezreal, there's many different forms of. There's Elnuk Ezreal, which I mean, you can run Freljord without Elnux. You can't run Elnux anymore. When I say Elnuk Ezreal, I mean Freljord. You can you can run Freljord version without Elnux. That's gonna be totally fine. You can run, like, you know, the Nox version now. You can run the Shadow Isles version now. Honestly, there's a lot of different ways to play Ezreal. Overall, I think Ezreal does get slightly worse. It's pretty close, though. I don't know. There's been this, like, this, this weird flavor of the week that's been happening. Where people are, you know, kind of just moving on to different Ezreal colors. It's like, people did, like, Nox for a bit, people did Karma for a bit. It's not like they're bad decks, but it's just, like, people are mostly just getting bored or, you know, getting excited about new stuff. It's like, people have tried them in the past, and they're not terrible, but I don't necessarily think that the future... Now that Elnux are getting nerfed, well, that's a pretty big deal. Now, suddenly, there's a decent chance that Freljord isn't the best way to play Ezreal anymore. In fact... I would take that bet. At 1 to 1 odds, which says my confidence in that is above 50%, that Freljord is no longer the best way to play Ezreal. Although that's mostly just because, you know, Freljord is one region and the other regions are four regions, right? So Ezreal definitely gets a bit worse. Unless, I mean, if, if, if you didn't think that the Freljord was the best way to play Ezreal, then you might feel like Ezreal stayed the same. Then we have Kinku Wayfinders, and these are basically like little little pink people. They're they're finding their way. And these are basically staying the same. I don't know. Conspirator losing one attack does matter quite a bit. I will say. It's like... Because you do kind of have to run that card still. I think it's kind of impossible to cut it. And having just like one less attack in every game is a pretty big deal. In terms of like your lethal ranges, you will be missing out. It's, it's pretty close to like... A little, a little down arrow or a little uh, black one. It's kind of in between there. And then there's like Shadow Isles anything, right? So Shadow Isles I'll represent by a green dude. I'm realizing at this point my drawing skills are bad to the point where I'm just drawing different colors of humanoids. And this one has a, a deep red arrow. Shadow Isles is just kind of bad in general. The Spiders is kind of the one deck in Shadow Isles that doesn't feel kind of too nerfed. When I say bad in general, I, I I don't mean they're shit per se. They're just coming down in pretty major ways, right? I mean, there's still like Spooky Karma. How will the Spooky Karma do after the Rekindler? So I'm pretty sure Rekindler nerf is basically the only thing that affects like the control deck. And then of course there's meta implications. And then there's like the Lux deck, which is on the up and up. So I will, I will visualize Lux as a, a yellow girl who's like, he's got this magic light beam. That's Lux. And this is a big green arrow, right? So something like this. And then there's like, <clears throat> Karma SI, that's gonna be pretty good. You lose Karma on five into Rekindler on six. I think Teal Red is buffed. See, that's interesting, cause Teal Red loses Hecarim and Rekindler, so that's a hot take. What's your, what's your stance on Teal Red getting buffed? Lux looks like a Bannerman, what are you, racist? Not a big deal, IMO. I do think that the Karma deck is still going to stand strong. Spooky Karma is a good full control deck. And is probably... It might be the best one when played at a high level. So I think overall I can say Spooky Karma is staying the same. Okay. How do you draw Spooky Karma? So it's like... Here's Karma, and she's got, like, spooky powers. Okay, that's spooky Karma. And this is, this is I would say, staying the same, right? Again, things are getting nerfed across the board. So anything anything that's, like, maintaining ground is, is going to be, uh, yeah, effectively just completely staying the same. So spooky Karma stays. Fearsome Rally is, is on its way out. Heimer Karma is up. Ezreal definitely feels at least a bit worse. And then you could be thinking about running something like Barrier Challenger. Dude, Demacia just feels great right now. I mean, that, that's just the new meta, right? 
the, we're just like in a full Demacia meta. By the for the record, I think Demacia was the strongest color in the game at a high level. Um, strong is a meaningless term that's gonna people are gonna disagree based on different definitions of that term. Shadow Isles was much more versatile. Shadow Isles and Demacia are like polar opposites, right? Where Demacia is really, really, really good at doing one thing and one thing only, and Shadow Isles is super versatile, so you can run it in a shit ton of different ways. But I, I might say that at a top level, Demacia was a stronger color than Shadow Isles. Like, I think that refined Demacia mid-range decks are really, really powerful, and I think it's impossible to run a mid-range concept without running Demacia. For, for it to be good. Like, your mid-range concept is going to be weaker for not running Demacia. And they buffed it in a major way. So I, w I will say that as, like, a, a meta note. That Demacia is definitely feeling very... I mean, again, it was arguably the strongest region in the game. Strong, again, it's just going to depend on your definition. It's, like, less versatile than Shadow Isles, sure. But it was nuts at doing what it did. So, I mean, you look at the Demacia buffs. And not only are... are you know, the mid-range is standing strong, right? Demacia Allegiance is premium. They didn't really get very nerfed, right? They lose Rekindler and Garen, but, I mean, they'll just splash a different color and still be fine, right? And everything else is getting at least a little bit nerfed. Everything else is getting nerfed. Nothing is dodging the nerfs, right? So, like, even, even like, Wayfinders are losing one attack point on, you know, um, Navor Conspirator. So, that's gonna be pretty big. And you might, a big question, a really, really big question is, will you be able to splice Mage Seekers into some of the Demacian decks, right? That's a big question that we're going to have to answer, okay? Will you be able to splice Mage Seeker into the Demacia decks? There's the Asian Demacia Allegiance deck with the Rekindler replaced with Zed Lucian. Yeah, I like, I like Zed Lucian. That's like 209 style of deck as well. I played that for a while. I think it's very good. And, yeah, like, I mean, the, the deck just hasn't really needed Garen for a while. It's just the Garen version smashed the mirror. So, we're, we, we are in the reign of Demacia, my friends. Like, Demacia is crazy right now. Super, super, super nuts. You can play it, like, kind of like a, a spell-based deck, or you can play a unit-based deck. And they're both going to be pretty crazy. I think I would say they're, they're going to be different decks. At the end of the day, it feels really, really hard to run Mage Seeker in that deck. But... We'll, we'll leave that for the deck building segment. So overall, I'm just going to like wrap this up. The general meta impressions. So let's just go ahead and do a rough tier list. Tier 1, again, these are first impressions. Take this with a grain of salt. But right now, Demacia Allegiance is going to be very good. Something with Bannerman. I suspect Zed for the splash is going to be the second color. You can do it in a lot of ways. There's Sixo's Demacia Allegiance deck that runs like those, some of the barrier package with Shen. That works okay. Okay? Then there's the Lux version, which I suspect is going to end up being a Heimer deck. We'll see. But that's like Lux, let's say Heimer, or it could be Karma, right? Spooky Karma, I think at a very, very high level, Spooky Karma is still going to maintain Nuts value. I don't know if I can call it Tier 1 overall, because I think that while it's a very good deck at a high level, it's probably quite tricky to play. So I might put that in Tier 2 ultimately, uh, even though, of course, it's Nuts at a high level. So Spooky Karma is going to maintain a ton of value, as is Kinko Wayfinders. Kinko Wayfinders, you know, they lose one attack on Conspirator. There is a chance they will find some way to cut out the card and run it in some other way. But as a high-level deck that loses basically nothing else, I think that uh, Kinko Wayfinder is going to kind of stand strong. And again, anything that doesn't get nerfed will relatively get better. And this is kind of like right now what Tier 1 is looking like for me, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to look like this. What I will say is I don't expect full-on aggro to be great. So, there is some idea of aggro, and I don't know, I, I, I think it'll probably be some kind of like, you know, Nox PNZ discard aggro will actually be sweet, but I think that the mid-range implications in this meta are going to be keeping out aggro in general. And make no mistake, this is a mid-range deck, right? So, because Demacia is getting buffed, Mid-range decks are kind of going to be, you know, I mean, you might you might say that mid-range decks have kind of always been the thing, but, I mean, Ezreal has definitely lost some value. 
for sure. Ezreal's basically mid-range. Elnuk, Elnuk anything is mid-range, right? Uh, mid-range is probably getting stronger. Which means that there will be some kind of, like, control deck that will be able to go over it and outvalue it long-term. And I do personally think that that will be a version of, like, Lux that skews a little slower. Like, honestly, I mean, if you just if you just run this deck, like, this deck should be kind of favored against the Allegiance, right? It's like, Elusive will probably beat this. This will probably beat this, if anything. Although, it's actually going to be close. It's like, Elusive might be, like, 5% favored, maybe. I don't even know if this will be favored, but it could be. But yeah, these these are probably like the three tier one decks, I would say. I think that's that's gonna that's gonna be how it works out. So <clears throat> that is my meta assessment here, and then all we have left to do is get into the actual deck builds. I think that there will be room because these decks are gonna be very good. There will be room for some heavy control concepts for sure, but I don't expect them to be tier one. I expect them to kind of feed off the tier 1 decks. You know, stuff like Spooky Karma is going to do very well, but it's not going to set the pace of the meta, right? And that's really important to understand. Because tier 2 doesn't mean it has a lower win rate. In fact, in a, in a perfectly logical simulation, assuming that everybody on ladder was a logical agent, tier 2 decks would have the same exact win rates as tier 1 decks. And I know that's going to seem weird, but that's how tiers work. Tiers are measurements of stability, uh, and not necessarily power level, right? Because as the, as the play rate of one deck goes up, the win rate of it will go down. And that's always going to be how it works. So every deck is going to stabilize at, you know, the same win rate in theory. But the difference is, of course, is that there's going to be more people playing the tier one decks. And that's kind of how control works. It's like control will be able to have good win rates right now. But they themselves, I wouldn't call tier one decks. I don't think they're going to set the pace of the meta. So yeah, these, these are going to be three really good decks moving forward.